The next item of business is debate on motion 15390 in the name of Richard Leonard on Scotland's future economy. Uh, I would invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Richard Leonard to speak to and move the motion for up to 12 minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In recent weeks, uh, we have witnessed again the unacceptable face of capitalism from Kayam in West Lothian to Health Environmental Services in North Lanarkshire. Whilst this parliament was in recess, almost 500 working women and men discovered first that they were not being paid and then that they were losing their livelihoods altogether. Now there are outstanding questions in both of these recent workplace closures, which I hope we will get answers to this afternoon. Answers about who knew what and when, including Scottish Government officials and even Scottish Government ministers, which we will come to in this debate. But the point is that those industrious women and men who worked in these firms, those who through their hard work and endeavour actually created the wealth which built these businesses up, they were the last to know. And by any measure, economic, social, moral, that simply is not right. So we move this motion and raise this debate today, not simply because this is a battle over jobs in the Scottish economy, although it is, we raise it because this is a battle over justice in the Scottish economy. And the trouble is that what happened over the last few weeks is not unique. Over the last few months, I've met with too many working people whose jobs are under threat. Along with Colin Smith, who will speak in this debate, I met with the Pinnies workers in Annan where 700 jobs have now been lost in a devastating blow to the local community. In fact, I met them on the day that the first people left the factory for the last time. They told me it felt like a bereavement. Just before Christmas, I met with the workers at Gemini Rail Services in Springburn whose jobs are also now under threat. Jobs which have existed for 150 years. And I have to say this, that the economics of neoliberalism, the rule of the market, the push for deregulation, the doctrine of fiscal austerity, and the experiment of privatization, that is what has led in the end to this threat to these jobs in Springburn. So today's debate is about Parliament reasserting itself. It is a declaration of intent that the economy cannot be left to the market, that we will not stand by whilst working people are exploited and then cast aside. It is a rejection of the creed that the economy is nothing to do with Parliament and politics because it is everything to do with Parliament and politics. And this Parliament is nothing if it does not side with the working people we represent. And can I say that I do not believe that the answer to the crisis in our economy is to be found in nationalism, either Scottish or British, which is why we say to the SNP, of course, Brexit represents a major immediate threat to our economy. The reason many of us not only voted Remain, but campaigned for Remain in 2016 was precisely because of the big economic shock that withdrawal would bring. It's why we've argued for a customs union with the European Union. Why we've argued for a close economic relationship and access to the single market and a commitment to the maintenance of workers' rights, consumer rights, and environmental rights. And it's why we implacably all along the line have opposed a no-deal Brexit. 
but the damage posed to the Scottish economy by the threat of independence, which the First Minister was tweeting about just this morning and holding a press conference about just this afternoon, and the Growth Commission's prospectus, which she was not tweeting about, <laughs> which the Economy Secretary sat on, is far worse a threat. Yeah. So we will not be supporting the SNP amendment. Yes, I'll give way. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. I mean, apart from the bit about nationalism, I'll agree with a lot of what he said. If his attack is on neoliberalism, does he not think that Scotland might be healthier and might have less neoliberalism if we were independent? Richard Leonard. Uh, no. Um, neither, 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 will, neither will we support the Tory amendment. Well, I say to the member, look at the Growth Commission report. Yes. It's a recipe for neoliberalism and further austerity. Let me also say to the Chamber that neither will, we, neither will we support the Tory amendment, which advocates the very neoliberal small state free market economics which, which has created the crisis in the first place, which is now discredited, not least in the eyes of the people. The existing imbalance of power in our economy is not addressed by nationalism, which simply leaves economic relations and so power relations unreformed. Simply transferring power from one parliament to another or from one group of politicians to another, whether that is from Strasbourg and Brussels to London or from London to Edinburgh, does not address the real democratic deficit which exists. Because people need more than a vote, they need a voice. Which is why for us the answer is to be found first and foremost not in national sovereignty but in popular sovereignty. It is not simply enough either to denounce the existing system. We have to give people hope. To do nothing is to be complicit in these injustices that we've witnessed in recent weeks. So we firmly reject the doctrine of inevitable decline. We need to invest in a modernised industrial base, but we need to invest in the workforce to innovate and to run it as well. And let me be clear, the Scottish Labour Party is not simply calling for a Keynesian-style reflation of the old economy, or merely asking that the tears are taken out of capitalism, as somebody once said. We are calling for a wholly new approach based on popular democracy and workers' rights, on sustainable development, on a social purpose as well as an economic purpose. An approach to the economy where the needs of all will count for more than the profits of the few. Where as well there is nothing wrong with running industries and services in line with the wider national interest rather than the narrow shareholder interest. So it's a transformative change we are after building for full employment, investment-led, closing production gaps and productivity gaps, securing an industrial renaissance that is ecologically sustainable. With a new investment bank, which looks beyond the market and opens up the prospect of public planning. And the argument is not about whether we can afford to make the change, it is about a realization that we cannot afford not to. It's about new ideas, but old ideals as well. We are proud of the fact that we are a Labour Party that stands firm with the trade union movement. A Labour Party proud of its past, but building for a future. So we want Scotland, the home of Robert Owen, the birthplace of the Fenwick Weavers, to be the cooperative wellspring of democratic ownership, to become the Mondragon of the North. A new report by the New Economics Foundation entitled Cooperatives Unleashed shows the urgency of this. And with this ambition must come investment, but must also come accountability. So it is welcome that last August, the Scottish Government announced that it was setting up a new group to increase employee ownership, to increase it in Scotland from around 100 businesses to 500. But hugely disappointing that it was only given £75,000 to do it. 
And we know that this is symptomatic of a wider level of mediocrity and malaise in the landscape of industrial development support in Scotland. Since 2007, Scottish Enterprise has awarded £22, £222 million in regional selective assistance grants, but just £140 million of this has been awarded to Scottish-owned firms. And we know, because it is a matter of public record, that Michelin received £4.5 million of regional selective assistance, two sisters in Cambus Lang, a half a million pounds, and Kayam in Livingston, £850,000. And there is a wider point here about what this bias in grant awards means, because it has not challenged, it has entrenched even further the branch plant model of the Scottish economy, with the result that according to the Scottish Government's own statistics, Overseas owned firms now generate a third of all turnover in the Scottish economy and in manufacturing industries where much of regional selective assistance is targeted, nearly half of all turnover is now in firms which are owned overseas. So we want to see a rebalancing of the economy. We want to see more of a mixed economy. And so that means Gemini Rail Services, which for decades was in public ownership, should be considered once again for public ownership when we return the railways back to public ownership. It means that HES, which has grown as a result of public sector contracts, largely in the National Health Service, should be insourced, not outsourced. And we should be entering into agreements with companies which seek RSA grants or in future will seek Scottish National Investment Bank loans or equity stakes, agreements which include not just job guarantees, but investment guarantees. Uh, Mr. Lennarton's last, Lennart, last minute is just closing. And here's another radical idea. It means that all workers should be given a statutory preferential right to buy the enterprise they work for when it is put up for sale or facing closure. If this parliament can back land reform, let it also back industrial reform as well. This parliament and this government has a choice. We can go on as we are or we can take a more radical direction. Ownership is power. We can extend democracy in the economy. We can liberate people at work. We can make a real change. That is what people are crying out for. That is what this parliament needs to do. And that is what this Labour Party will continue to argue and campaign for. I move the motion in my name. I call Derek Mackay to speak to and move amendment 15390.3 for up to eight minutes, please. Uh, presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name and I'm genuinely pleased to respond to today's uh, debate on Scotland's future economy, uh, certainly following on from yesterday's just transition debate, which I think is pertinent. And I'm grateful to Richard Leonard for bringing this motion to Parliament today uh, for us to be able to, to consider our efforts around the economy and a very important matter uh, of jobs. Because across this chamber, I think we're all in agreement that Scotland does have huge economic potential and we all want to see fairness and quality employment as well. Now, Richard Leonard believes that Scotland's future economy needs an industrial strategy, and I say that we already have one, and it's focused on the strong, vibrant and diverse economy, which is necessary to support quality jobs and strong, resilient regional, regional economies. And of course, there is a challenge, uh, of course, Claudia Beamish. The Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention. Uh, Ms Beamish, could you correct your microphone, please? Help, isn't it? Thank you. Um, I, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can explain why um, regional selective assistance, as highlighted by, by my colleague Richard Leonard, um, is focused so much on firms which are foreign-owned um, rather than Indigenous. And is there, is there any way in which the Scottish Government can address this quickly? Derek Mackay. Well, I mean, f first of all, I, I'm... I'm genuinely trying to make this as consensual as possible because I actually think there's a lot of agreement on what we're trying to achieve for the economy and I'm genuinely trying to uh, ensure that we, we, we reach that consensus. The simple answer is first we're bound by um, uh, some legal impediments as to how we can direct financial support, state aid rules, so on and so forth. Uh, do I want to support indigenous companies? Of course I do. But equally, when there's quality employment, I'll come back to Michelin. Michelin is a foreign-owned company. I don't think Richard Leonard was suggesting for one moment that we shouldn't have been supporting Michelin, for example, to grow, expand and recalibrate. So I make the point 
that on the one hand we're being asked why don't we do more to support companies provide quality jobs and then at the same time be challenged on why are we supporting certain foreign-owned companies uh, to grow in Scotland. But do we want to do more domestically? Yes. Do we want to do more around the kind of debate we were having yesterday in the just uh, transition? Yes, uh, we do. And we are recalibrating the enterprise agencies work on upskilling uh, and upscaling um, domestic and, and indigenous companies as well. So I'm very focused on that and very focused on targeting our financial support to do that as well. And I hope that that reassures uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, but the government is uh, working to create the conditions for greater and inclusive economic growth, uh, to raise its standard of living and better fund uh, our uh, services. I think it is right that Parliament reasserts itself, but I think that we have taken a number of actions in relation to very individual, industrial and commercial difficulties uh, over the recent period. The Business Minister, uh, Jamie Hepburn, was able to cover in detail at the Economy Committee that I was also giving evidence at in relation to some of the companies uh, that Richard Leonard uh, had um, raised. Uh, there was, a, I mean, I suppose that the, the leader of the Labour Party in Scotland, you would expect, is is, is seeking to abolish capitalism as he sees it. I have to say the Scottish Parliament's a wee bit constricted on what we can do in terms of macroeconomic policy and the economic um, model. I hear Murdo Fraser say just as well, but you see, that's the difficulty, uh, that we are bound by Westminster decisions in terms of macroeconomic policy in large part. But that which we can do, uh, we, we are doing uh, to try and support an economic strategy that sets out our vision for sustainable and inclusive growth, and growth that does boost competitiveness uh, whilst tackling inequalities, growth that delivers for our communities, for the environment and workers, uh, and for business. Now, the Economic Action Plan was launched last year, and it does reinforce the vision that we've set out. Uh, examples of the uh, financial investment that we're making to achieve that vision include city and region uh, deals. They're focused on tackling inequality and supporting those regional uh, economies. So far, we've committed over £1 billion of investment uh, through the city region deals across Scotland. And this significant injection of investment to accelerate inclusive economic growth can deliver tangible uh, benefits in the form of jobs and new opportunities in growth areas for businesses to expand in that inclusive way. And that is why the, the amendment of put forward references uh, the growth deals and the uh, demand for UK government to match the funding that Scottish government has committed to. But in addition to their direct impact, these deals have been the catalyst for the development of regional economic partnerships, which are evolving across Scotland. Now, the partnerships bring together local authorities, education, skills providers, the third sector, and the private sector too, and they can be powerful tools uh, to create the linkages across the economy to drive that inclusive growth. Now, I just want to reference some of the current economic uh, indicators, because it's where we are right now in terms of the unemployment rate sitting at 3.8%, its joint lowest rate on record and lower than that of the UK. It productivity growth has been higher than any other country or region in the UK, including London, since 2007, so over the period of devolution. Yes, we want to see more around employee ownership in Scotland, and that's why we've set up the commitments around the programme for government. But in terms of GDP growth, and we've had five consecutive quarters of growth. And I say that this is uh, challenged uh, by the Brexit uh, chaos that's been brought upon us uh, by the UK government. But I heard what Richard Leonard said uh, very clearly. Many workers in Cambus Lang, uh, Dingwall, Dumfries, Dundee, Livingston and Shorts will take little comfort from the success elsewhere in those economic indicators. Those workers are affected. I absolutely are very mindful of that in terms of the support that we can put in place as a government and, of course, pace when that's required as well. Uh, some companies volunteer to the Scottish Government, the financial difficulties uh, that they find themselves in, and some do not. And where we have a willing partner, where we, now I would like to make some further progress because I have not much time left, but I have a few things I want to say. But specifically where we can take actions we have, and I think I've been able to show that in a number of areas, in pace it say, gets involved when there are uh, redundancy issues and we try and find alternative employment. But, but let's not forget the Michelin example in Dundee that I've mentioned, because that was a, a partnership approach bringing together key politicians, uh, the local authority, the company involved, and crucially the trade unions to get the best possible outcome for the site and its workers. And that will lead to future growth opportunities around um, quality employment and innovation that will make a difference, for example, in remanufacturing, recycling and low carbon uh, transport. So that's supporting the ambitions, as I say, that we, we've laid out in recent debates 
and also support the workers in what's been a very difficult time. Now, each company is, diff is different, of course, and I do want to mention that, that what is the biggest threat to our economy right now, because it is significant and real. I think I'm in my final He's minute. in his last minute, Ms Mara. So I just want to say a word about Brexit, because leaving the European Union and taking us out of the single market against their interests will place Scotland at a competitive disadvantage. And that's why there's reference of Brexit in the government's amendment. So the, bake is, uh, the, the debate may well be focused on business. Um, and it's not unreasonable to expect uh, the UK government to set out urgently in clear terms what it plans to do to support the economy and businesses as they face the Brexit challenge. And equally, I will set out the further support uh, that we can deliver uh, as a government. But there is now that chaos created by the UK government that we want to address. But in conclusion, presiding officer, we do want Scotland to be the best place to live, work and invest. The government is absolutely uh, committed to that through the economic action plan and the economic strategy that we've set out. We will intervene where we can, where there's ways we can support companies and the workforce. And we do have that desire, as Richard Leonard has set out, for more employee-owned uh, companies as well. So Scotland does have huge economic potential and we want to work together to ensure that we can unlock that potential in the interest of all the people of Scotland. And I call Dean Lockhart to speak to and move Amendment 15390.1 for up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the fiscal framework now means that the size of the Scottish Government budget will in large part be determined by the performance of Scotland's economy relative to the rest of the UK. For the past 11 years under the SNP, Scottish economic growth has been an average of 0.7%, uh, what the Fraser of Allender has described as the longest period of low growth in 60 years and half the rate of UK economic growth. The uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission is forecasting another five years of Scotland's economy underperforming the rest of the UK, and this will have a significant, significantly negative impact on the Scottish budget. So here we have it. After 11 years of SNP government, we have a low growth, low productivity, and low wage economy. We have an SNP government that has failed to meet every one of its own seven ec economic targets. Scotland is now the highest tax part of the UK for workers earning over 26,000 pounds and for businesses looking to expand. We have the lowest business creation rates in the UK and we have seen a series of large scale business failures referred to in Labour's motion showing that the SNP's enterprise policy is not working. Presiding officer, it doesn't have to be this way. Scotland's long-term economic growth rate is above 2%, and we, on this side of the chamber, believe that Scottish economic growth can return to those levels. But to do so, I will, to do so, we need a new direction in economic policy, and perhaps Derek Mackay is about to tell us what his new economic policy will be. Derek Mackay. Well, Dean Lockhart's just mentioned uh, there is a different path. Can I ask, will Brexit assist GDP growth or be a disadvantage to GDP growth? Dean Lockhart is that Brexit applies across all of the UK and we're seeing the UK, the rest of the UK growing at far stronger rates than in Scotland and the Cabinet Secretary should not try to use Brexit to, as a, uh, to blame his underperformance for the past 11 years because the Scottish economy has underperformed for 11 years under the SNP. We have, I, I need to make a bit of progress. We have long argued that the SNP's economic uh, policy is not fit for purpose. The Fraser of Allender agrees. Late last year, the Fraser of Allender called for the SNP to change course when it said, let me make a bit of progress, Fraser of Allender said it's time the government looked again at its overall approach to economic policy. Commenting on Derek Mackay's so-called economic action plan, the Fraser of Allender said, where is the clarity? Where is the clarity of purpose that underpins what the government is trying to achieve? So our amendment to the Labour motion today indicates how the Scottish Government can deliver and change course on economic policy and deliver the high paid jobs that everyone wants. The UK industrial strategy is the most far reaching and ambitious UK economic policy in decades. Under the UK industrial strategy, 50 billion pounds of funding will be made available for research and development, investment in new technology and the commercialization of innovation across the UK. It makes available a scale of investment for Scotland's economic development that would not be possible in a standalone Scottish economic policy. Investment of scale, additional R&D, global expertise is precisely what many of Scotland's new innovative industries need to scale up, including life sciences, low carbon and fintech. And according to the Scotch Whiskey Association, 
the UK industrial strategy presents an opportunity for the Scotch whisky industry to flourish as a flagship manufacturer and exporter. I, I will in a second. And to address Richard Leonard's concerns over neoliberalism, the UK industrial strategy is about creating higher paid jobs. It is not trickle down economics. I'll give way. Jamie Hepburn. I, I, I just wonder if Mr Lockhart can explain if the UK's approach to research and development policy is so much better than Scotland's. Why in 2017 R&D spend here in Scotland increased by 13.9%, but in the UK as a whole it only increased by 2.9%. Dean Lockhart. I think you'll find that over the last 11 years R&D across the UK as a whole has been higher in Scotland on business research and development. So, presiding officer, to fully capitalise on these uh, opportunities under the UK uh, industrial strategy and to create the high paid jobs the Scottish economy needs, uh, the government should incorporate elements of the UK industrial strategy into its economic policy and work closely with the UK government to deliver the full benefits. We have also long argued that increasing the tax gap between Scotland and the rest of the UK will damage the economy. Scotland needs to be able to attract the brightest and the best from around the world. This is important not just to address the skills gap in highly skilled sectors, but we need to attract more higher paid workers to strengthen Scotland's tax base. The Finance Committee has heard evidence that for every 20 new additional rate taxpayers in Scotland, the Scottish Government would get an extra £1 million in tax revenue meaning that if we can attract 2,000 new additional rate taxpayers to Scotland, the Scottish Government budget will get an extra £100 million a year in tax revenue. But instead of trying to attract those higher paid workers to Scotland, the SNP is doing exactly the opposite by making Scotland the highest tax part of the UK for those workers. So it's time for the SNP to listen to leading organisations such as the Scottish Life Sciences Association and reverse its policy of increasing the tax gap between Scotland and the rest of the UK. In the area of enterprise and skills policy, Scotland spends £2.5 billion a year on enterprise. That's more than 50% higher than the rest of the UK, but we are seeing uh, de uh, business development rates and economic growth lower than uh, the rest of the UK. And last year, this parliament passed a motion recognising the problem of a cluttered enterprise landscape. However, instead of streamlining the enterprise landscape, the SNP has created another two quangos, the Strategic Board and the Scottish, the Scottish National Investment Bank, and it's not, still not clear how those body, bodies will help streamline the enterprise landscape. And that's why we're calling for the enterprise landscape to be streamlined. It needs real leadership from the Scottish Government, and taxpayers need to see a better return for their investment. Uh, Presiding officer, government policy also needs to prepare Scotland for a digital future. At the Economy Committee, we heard that only 9% of business in Scotland have embedded digital in their business operations. That compares with 43% of business in other countries. This digital gap presents a massive challenge for companies that are looking to increase their exports. The global export market is increasingly dominated by e-commerce and digital platforms. And Scottish business will lose out on those trading op opportunities if we do not address this digital gap. That's why we're calling for the establishment of a dedicated institute of e-commerce, a specialist uh, public agency in Scotland that would help move large and small businesses online in order to take advantage of global opportunities in e-commerce and get the Scottish economy ready for a digital future. Uh, let me wrap up, presiding officer. Uh, we've heard yet again that the cabinet secretary will attempt to hide his 11 year uh, economic failure by blaming Brexit. But the reality is the SNP has been in charge of Scotland's economy for 11 long years and they've turned it into a low growth, low productivity and low wage economy and that is why it is time for a new direction in Scotland's economic policy. I move the amendment in my name. I call Patrick Harvey a strict six minutes please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to this debate. And in particular, I'm grateful that Richard Leonard's motion gives us all the opportunity to reinforce the opening sentiment in the, in the first lines uh, of the motion in expressing solidarity with those who've been affected by recent announcements of uh, workplace closures and job losses. Uh, the individuals, their families, their wider communities who've been affected uh, should be in all of our thoughts. And I'm pleased also that Richard Leonard's speech uh, in opening this debate made clear the argument that the wealth 
of our economy is created by all of us, by people working in the economy, not by some uh, supernatural small subsection of society called wealth creators or entrepreneurs. It is not only those who own businesses or who control capital who create the wealth of our economy. It's all of us, and not just those in paid employment either. A great deal of unpaid work in our society, whether in, uh, in caring for one another, in looking after our communities, in volunteering within them, uh, is also critical to the creating the wealth in the widest sense uh, of our whole society. So I'm, I'm pleased also that the, the motion offers uh, an opportunity for some consensus. Uh, my own amendment, which wasn't selected, would have added a little. The, the Liberal Democrats uh, hadn't uh, added a, a, an amendment, so I assume that they're happy with the, the motion. We'll, we'll hear that in a moment. And the, and the government amendment also adds to the motion that's been submitted. And I do regret if we're not going to see the opportunity for consensus if the, if the Labour Party doesn't support the government amendment. I, I will say very bluntly to, to, to Richard Leonard, and in the, in the, in the best uh, and hopefully most constructive sense, if the government's amendment had been uh, raving on about the Growth Commission, I'd have been voting against it absolutely. I'd have been voting against that kind of agenda without hesitation. The government's amendment doesn't do that. It talks about extra investment, Perhaps not as much as is justified, but I hope none of us would, would uh, be unwilling to welcome the extra investment if the UK government was to make it. And it talks about ruling out a no-deal Brexit, and I hope that that's something that the Labour Party would also agree with. So I, I, I would regret it if we can't unite uh, on, that, uh, on that point. I give way. Neil Finlay. Uh, I don't know if Mr Harvey was in for the, the, the statement from the Cabinet Secretary, but I made it absolutely clear, as did Richard Leonard in his speech, that we oppose a no-deal Brexit, absolutely, and we will never accept that. Patrick I'm very, Harvey. I'm very pleased to hear that, and I, and I hope that we can unite uh, in, the, in that position by backing the, the amendment which includes it. I'm always happy to debate the future of the economy. One of the reasons why the Green Movement and the Green Party exists is to, is to offer different ideas about the future of our economy, because we're convinced that the current extractive, exploitative, fossil fuel powered and growth dependent uh, economic model that's dominant in the, in the world has given us a leg of, legacy of environmental crisis and inequality. And our approach to this and to the case for an industrial strategy was set out largely yesterday uh, in the debate on just transition. Uh, the work that we've done, including a report jobs in Scotland's new economy, showed how there is a huge opportunity to create high value, lasting, genuinely sustainable uh, employment in the industries which can replace fossil fuels. But we're not going to see that change take place if we don't recognize the change that is coming. And I would make the, the comparison between that approach to, uh, to the fossil fuel industries as they exist in, in Scotland at the moment uh, and something on a smaller scale like Longanet. For years, we all knew that Longanet was coming to the end of its life. The government knew it, local council knew it, the owners and operators of the plant knew it, and the workforce knew it. Everybody knew that plant was coming to the end of its life. And for the most part, people buried their heads and said, no, no, we're fully committed to the long-term operation of this plant. The last 10 years of that plant's operation should have been dedicated to generating investment in the local area to replace that economic activity. We're in danger, we're in danger in just a moment of seeing the same kind of uh, failure uh, to invest uh, on a much bigger scale in relation to the North Sea. The oil and gas industry cannot last in its current form, at least not on the current scale. It is not the future of our economy, and we're only going to make the case for investment in something new, something that can genuinely be sustainable if we recognize the change that's coming. And I give way. Rachel Hamilton. Patrick Harvey for the intervention. And I'm interested in his comments about um, the jobs that are reliant actually on fossil fuel um, energy production. Going forward, we'll be looking at uh, new forms of energy. And I just wondered if the Green Party had any uh, solutions or suggestions uh, for job recreation uh, that won't be as, um, as many jobs created within that fossil fuel industry. Yes, Patrick indeed. Harvey. I'll very happily send her a link to the, the, the various reports that we've published on that over the years. Um, the, 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 
The one opportunity that I would set out is the case for local energy companies, for example. If every local authority in Scotland had the opportunity to create its own local energy company, perhaps in concert with housing associations or with other community uh, bodies or, or local development trusts, there'd be a huge opportunity to turn more of the economic activity of the energy industry into public investment in the built environment and others. The last point I'll make, presiding officer, I know we're tight for time, I do say, Brexit is a profound threat, not only Brexit, but also the loss of freedom of movement, an historic political achievement that is about empowering people in the economy. And I do hope that Richard Leonard, in his closing speech, might take the chance to agree that we must not return to the idea of an economy where capital is freer to move than people are. And if his party is committed to that, will he continue to back the principle of freedom of movement whatever the outcome of the Brexit shambles that we're seeing down south. Willie Reddy, uh, six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer. We are living at an incredible moment. I agree with the SNP amendment that Brexit is the biggest threat to our economy, to our cost of living and our way of life. Breaking from Europe would be damaging. And to the Labour members that are still here, that means any kind of Brexit not just a no-deal Brexit. That would be damaging, but so would any kind of Brexit too. But breaking from the UK with independence would be equally damaging, if not more damaging, if we were to agree to it. We should learn the lessons from Brexit and reject independence too. So yes, the Scottish economy is stuttering. Yes, there is a real need to address the specific job losses and at specific locations across Scotland mentioned in the Labour motion and the pain that that causes to families and individuals. And yes, city deals are part of the solution. We agree that the UK government should contribute more to the city deals. £388 million is that difference between this, what the Scottish government is contributing and what the UK government is contributing. Nick Clegg was the driver behind the city deals during the coalition days. Remember those calm, calm period during politics? Oh, I wish we could return to that Good calm government. period with Nick Clegg. It is uh, reasonable for me to point out that the one deal before the 2015 election, the Glasgow city deal, saw a broadly equal level of funding from the two governments. The Conservatives should have stuck to that wise Liberal Democrat approach from the Nick Clegg days. But today I want to talk about an issue that doesn't just affect our economy and our way of life, but will affect countries across the world. We are in the midst of a technological age that is transforming the world around us at a pace that we have never seen before. The internet has fundamentally changed almost every aspect of our lives. How we work, how we shop, and how we relate to one another. Advances in robotics and artificial intelligence are creating possibilities that just a few short years ago were the realm of science fiction. But with the age of the internet, every great liberating advance that is produced throws up new problems and new risks as well. Constant technological advances in automation and artificial intelligence threaten many traditional jobs, manufacturing, retail, transport, professional services. In the next 15 years, almost one in every three current jobs in Britain could be automated. That's one in three. That's 10 million people. What will we say to the truck driver whose job is a thing of the past? To the shop assistant laid off as robots fill the gap? To the paralegal or auditor whose knowledge and analysis is no match for the algorithm. Machines do still have limits and will continue to do so. They cannot empathize or accurately mimic the full complexity of human interaction. Increasingly, this will be what separates us from them. Our very humanity will be more precious than ever. For example, our aging population requires a growing care sector. Care work should no longer be dismissed as low paid and unskilled. Instead, we need a care revolution. 
to place caregiving where it belongs as a vital and hugely valued part of our society, with well-paid staff recognised for the significant skills that they bring. I believe we should welcome the advent of new technologies and the opportunities that they bring. But we must anticipate those without adaptable skills could be hurt very badly indeed. One of the answers must be a massive investment in educational skills and retraining. New technologies can create high-skilled, well-paid jobs or turn us into minimum wage drones. Search for list of potential new jobs and they all sound like something straight out of a sci-fi novel. Cyber city analyst, man machine team manager, personal data broker. There are stories of faceless algorithms bossing around warehouse staff to meet next day delivery targets. Workers who avoid drinking water so they don't lose time going to the toilet. Technology is supposed to make work better. It isn't supposed to turn us into machines. We must ensure that the proceeds of that progress too are not hoarded by the rich and powerful, but shared to create a fair and just society. So the government must start planning for this future. This is not the time for incremental change. That is why my party has established a technology and artificial intelligence commission to explore how we can make the most of the possibilities that this revolution brings and ensure that all of us can benefit from them. This has been led by Dr Sue Black, who led the campaign to save Bletchley Park. The advances in robotics and artificial intelligence will help us do things that many of us have committed to over the generations on education, transport, poverty, health care and more. But we must plan, address the challenges that come with that progress and ensure we all share from the proceeds of that change. Thank you. Uh, we move to the open debate and can I give members warning that we're very short of time, so strict timings of six minutes, uh, unless otherwise agreed. Uh, Jenny Mara, followed by Angela Constance. Five minutes, please, Ms <coughs> Mara. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My own city of Dundee knows all too well the pain of factory closures and job losses. When globalisation was a new phenomena, Dundee was at the forefront of it with the bitter and heartbreaking closure of Timex. Ten years later, Levi's closed its doors and NCR has gone from employing 6,000 people, including members of my family, to 500 today. Now Michelin too is due to close and at the start of November, Michelin announced it would end production in Dundee by 2020, the loss of 845 highly skilled, well-paying jobs and the closure of Dundee's last large-scale manufacturing plant. The Cabinet Secretary knows that for years it was known in the city that Michelin owed its survival in a difficult global market to a productive workforce and a stellar relationship between the trade union and management. But it was not enough for it to survive today's environment and we have seen the flight of capital again from our city and the awful knowledge of the impact of that on our community. Just this morning, presiding officer, I visited HMRC in Dundee, which is due to close in 2022 with the loss of another 300 jobs. People have planned their lives, their families, taken finance on their homes, holidays, on the basis of expected income and security. I heard at HMRC this morning of staff who were married to staff at Michelin, expecting both to lose their jobs in the next two to three years. And then the further critical consideration for us as politicians, as well as the devastating impact for the existing workers, is the fewer opportunities in the community for children leaving school and college to go into. If it were 850 fewer opportunities at Michelin, that would be bad enough. And I have described some historical closures, but the tally of job loss in Dundee today is much worse for families. In 2016, I fought unsuccessfully alongside the 115 Flint workers to save their plant. They had a group of workers that wanted to buy their plant, as Richard Leonard suggested, but that option was close to them. The same year, Pressure Fab closed with loss of 42 jobs. The previous year, Muirfield shut 
with redundancy of 284 construction workers. More job losses in the games sector in Dundee have been announced just this week. People generally feel more secure in public sector jobs, but that is not the case today in Dundee with these 300 job losses at HMRC and Dundee City Council itself expected to make approximately 400 council workers redundant as a result of this terrible budget settlement for local government from the SNP. We now know that NHS Tayside is planning 1,300 fewer posts over the next few years. Fewer staff, Cabinet Secretary, is never going to solve the well-documented problems of NHS Tayside, and politicians running this government in Scotland should know that. I say to Derek Mackay today, we cannot go on like this. His government is adding insult to injury with public sector job cuts. Now, the Cabinet Secretary will remember at the end of November, he admitted to me at a meeting in Dundee that this government has no economic plan for the city of Dundee. They have supported the waterfront and they have put in place a steering group for Michelin. But we need a much wider economic plan for Dundee, where I hesitate to say this, presiding officer, but work is fast becoming a privilege rather than an expectation. And that is why the Labour motion is so important today, because our politics were founded on the basis that the right to work dignifies people, brings hope and security. The constitutional debates are clearly critical for the economic conditions they create, but we cannot take our eyes off of what can be done here she, and Ms. now Maris, just closing. in Scotland to create a better economy. Cabinet Secretary, I would say today that we need a proper economic strategy, one specifically for Dundee. We have terrible employment figures. We have one of the highest, sorry, the lowest male employment rate in Scotland and the highest proportion of males in part-time work. And he knows where there is joblessness, there is poverty and all its associated problems. I would like him today to commit to a proper plan for Dundee. I wasn't allowed to take your intervention, but I'm sure you will give me that commitment in your closing speech. Thank you, presiding officer. Angela Constance, followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, presiding officer. Like others, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to express my solidarity with all of those who have lost their jobs across Scotland in recent weeks. I represent the constituency that I grew up in and I've spoken before how unemployment marked uh, my own upbringing and any time there are job losses in my constituency, most recently uh, with the events at Kayam, it always feels like someone is picking a scab or poking at a sore spot. And I, like many members, have been involved in supporting and representing many people over the years who've lost their jobs. But it is still hard to find the words to express uh, the experience I recently had uh, being present at the meeting on Christmas Eve where the administrator's KPMG broke the news to over 300 workers uh, that they were being made redundant without notice or pay uh, before Christmas. And despite the difficulty and distress, I was really uh, struck by the dignity of the workforce, not that they should ever have had to endure uh, this treatment. And we shouldn't forget that work is part of our, our purpose in life. It's, it's part of our identity as well as how we, we make a living. And creating meaningful employment uh, is indeed the most important social policy. And I've heard the Cabinet Secretary uh, rightly make that point uh, on a number of occasions. Design officer, I do want to take the opportunity once again to pay tribute to the wider West Lothian community for really rallying around uh, the Kayam workforce. You just have to look at the Let's Help Kayam Employees Facebook page uh, to see uh, that people are posting job vacancies, uh, offering to help others with CVs, as well as the, the work around donations and fundraising. But the Kayam experience does remind us of some of the lessons that we do really need to start to learn. And our economic strategy, uh, in my view, needs to be smarter uh, at getting the right balance and the right connections between the local, the national and the international. 
Globalisation is, is not new. It's not the discovery of our generation. And you only need to look at the history of the Silk Roads to understand that. And time and time again in West Lothian, we've seen public money invested in large, often international companies, who at some point uh, later uh, up sticks. And can I say, I want the Scottish Government and Scottish Enterprise to continue to invest in West Lothian. And I do recognise that you can only ever uh, reduce risk and can never remove it entirely. But our actions and investments must always seek to really anchor high quality jobs in our communities and to have that forensic understanding of the nature of any business in any sector and the interplay between the local, national uh, and international settings. And Kayam, it was dependent on business from big data companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, operating in a highly uh, competitive market with stiff competition from China. But Kayam didn't just shaft its workforce, it also cheated small supply chain companies uh, out of payments too. And we must of course scrutinise how Scottish Enterprise and others detect the early warning signs of financial difficulties in companies, particularly the ones that they account manage. Kayam, a uh, history of late uh, laying of his accounts, hadn't made a profit since 2012 and had a history of laying staff off. And we know that 95% of companies in this country are small to medium-sized enterprises. And if we truly believe in diversifying our economy and not putting all our eggs in one basket, we need to have stronger, earlier outreach and support to smaller enterprises of all shapes and sizes across all sectors from the grassroots up. And the debate next week on regional economic partnerships and city deals, I think, is timely. So, President Officer, we do need a broad-based economic strategy uh, with inclusive growth at its very heart. Uh, the government, and in particular its agencies, should be more assertive and, dare I say, more aggressive about the business pledge and the fair work uh, agenda. Um, as time is short, I can't bear to talk more about uh, Brexit. Um, I do want to say that we uh, do look forward to the day where there are more economic and financial powers returned to Scotland, in particular the, the national uh, minimum wage. But I'll just end by saying that the lightning rod uh, of our economy uh, should be tackling inequality, supporting job creators, large and small, being serious about diversity in our workforce and diversification in our economy and getting out and about, uh, raising our horizons uh, beyond the sterile uh, Scotland versus the rest of the UK economic comparators and getting out and about uh, uh, along uh, those uh, silk roads, perhaps. Uh, I thank Ms Constance for her brevity. Remind members of six minute speeches unless previously agreed. And I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, presiding officer. May I uh, refer members to my register of interests? Um, businesses, as we are discussing today, are the backbone of our economy in Scotland and indeed in my own constituency of the borders. In recent time, we've seen significant lo job losses and business closures across the region. And economic mismanagement is at the heart of the debate today. And for a decade, we've seen the SNP's fiscal incompetency hit businesses and in turn hit jobs. Scotland's economic growth forecast is lower than the UK, as my colleague Dean Lockhart said. Scotland's economy is growing at half of the rest of the UK and as a whole, and, a, and business investment in Scotland is at a lower level than in 2014. And as Angela Constance, and a, it, just in a second, and as Angela Constance said, this isn't about comparing with the rest of the UK. Hopefully we can get to the point where actually we can be a success. Um, as, as successful as the rest of the UK. Yes, I'll give way to John Mason. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member very much for giving way. Would you accept that at least some of the responsibility for the economy might lie with the Westminster government? Rachel Hamilton. But in response to John Mason, I would say perhaps um, now is the time to consider getting involved in the industrial strategy. There's a long term, there's a long term ambition there to tackle productivity and to tackle the low wage economy uh, that we're currently in, which is actually hitting families hard. Well, we all know on these benches that you do not grow the economy by hiking up tax on businesses. And under the SNP, unfortunately, we have seen that. Whether it's on the high street or the factory floor, the SNP's assault on businesses has meant that the ordinary hard-working people have lost their jobs and trading has in some cases ceased altogether. A cacophony of higher taxes 
whether the large business supplement or higher income tax combined with an obsession with independence has damaged business investment and expansion in Scotland. And that is regrettable, I must say. The constituency I represent in Ettrick, Roxburgh, and Berwickshire has seen its fair share of job losses and workplace closures of late, a fact which is mirrored across Scotland. Recently, we've seen the coat hanger manufacturer Minetti in Jedburgh suffer. Minetti in... Can, can I finish the bit about Minetti, please? Minetti employs more than 350 staff in Jebra. However, before Christmas, they saw 50 job cuts due to a restructuring programme, which is fair enough, but it seems to be mirrored across Scotland, as I said. 50 job losses in a small town such as Jebra is significant, and it was and still is distressing for families and friends and for all those involved. And back in 2017, Minetti made a loss of 561,000, and this year they are forecast to make a loss again. After I've taken an intervention, I'll, I'll discuss how Jim Hutchison um, believes that this has happened. Derek Mackay. Can I thank Rachel Hamilton for allowing to make the intervention and referencing the economic indicators and the responsibility of the Scottish Government. It, what does Rachel Hamilton have to say to the fact then that unemployment in Scotland is lower than unemployment for the rest of the United Kingdom and as at a record low level? Rachel Hamilton. I congratulate um, the Scottish Government on that figure. However, it, it states that since 2010 productivity ha has been low and also the um, job the actual security of jobs, the number of hours that people are working um, is actually quite low. And so what we need to do is make sure that people have future job security. Yep. So we know that um, uh, we've just talked about the, the Minetti having um, these troubles and, and the managing um, director of Minetti, Jim Hutchison, um, couldn't have been clearer on the point um, when he said, and I quote, the business is faced with an ever-increasing cost base with increases in national minimum wage, higher electricity costs and higher business rates. And, and what we can do here is, is look at the um, things that are the responsibility of the Scottish Government and the large business supplement has been detrimental to business expansion in the borders and is now causing uh, firms to cut jobs as a result. Recent analysis has shown that over 320 large businesses in the borders will fork out over 1.4 million in the upcoming financial year because of the SNP's large business supplement. However, some 10 miles over the border in England, we see a different picture with lower rates, and the SNP were warned about this disparity. Their own Barclay review recommended that competitive disadvantage caused by the large business su supplement should be ended. And why would a large business want to trade in Jebra and Kelso? Of course, it's a beautiful place. It's a wonderful place to um, live and work. But perhaps they would consider relocating to Berwick. It could turn a larger profit and therefore employ more local people uh, and in turn give them the opportunity to invest further within their businesses. And we know that policies drive behavioural change. Clearly, presiding officer, when it comes to business rates on large, uh, large businesses, Scotland is uncompetitive and discouraging at the moment. But something could be done about that. Derek Mackay could sort that out. Um, the large business supplement is only one part of the story. The anti-business environment that has been created is in evident in the startup figures highlighted recently in the Sunday Times. There's a sharp increase in company formations occurring in other cities, major cities in the rest of the UK. However, in Glasgow and Edinburgh, it's a different story. Glasgow saw 4.3 fewer startups compared to 2017, and the figures were worse for Edinburgh, um, down by 6.5%. Can I just check, presiding officer, because I took in two interventions. Can I just... No, I have no, no? spare time. Right, I'll, I'll come to um, my conclusion. Uh, I do believe that um, the SNP are hitting businesses with higher taxes. Um, it's having a consequence. We're seeing fewer jobs, fewer business startups, and a lack of focus on supporting mature job-creating companies. And I think that's what Labour's motion today is highlighting, is that that's where we need to see the focus, is on supporting mature companies who are somehow just falling um, off the radar. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. Sandra White, followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you very much, President Officer. I certainly am looking forward to this debate and had been looking forward to it. The unfortunate thing is that I'm sorry that Richard Leonard chose to, to use provocative words, as he might say. Uh, I could just give him a couple of lessons in, in the respect. That it seems to me that everybody's a basket case apart from, from the UK uh, and the Union. Uh, the most successful countries in the world are Luxembourg, Norway, Ireland, Switzerland, Netherlands and Sweden. All small independent countries, Mr. Leonard. And I think it's about time people actually learn that, that we don't have all the levers. Wish we had, but I didn't want to react to that. I'm sorry, but I think it's time people actually learn. If you've only got 59 
MPs representative out of 650 in Westminster. I don't think that's a very democratic level playing field, but I've said what I wanted to say, and uh, thank you, President Officer, for, for bearing with me on that particular one. I wanted to start off with you know, the motion that the Labour Party put forward, and I do absolutely express solidarity. It's not a strange word to me, solidarity, having been a shop steward and a trade unionist. It's not just the Labour Party that own that particular word. Uh, the people in the communities who have suffered, as basically said in the motion, uh, the closures, and I do express my concerns to the many people unsure and worrying about their jobs and, and the future. And it doesn't just take in the jobs that's been lost and the, the companies that's been mentioned in the motion by the Labour Party. I'm thinking about two particular huge companies, and two of them are based in my constituency in Glasgow, HMV. People are worried. They don't know what's going to happen. We're in limbo at the moment. Debenhams is sitting there as well, and they are worried too. So I think about them as well, and all the others are uncertain about their future. And I'll go on to Brexit, uh, who certainly is uh, putting forward an uncertain future. And I do welcome the, the call that's been mentioned, the Scottish Government motion, I think the, uh, the Lib Dems mentioned that as well, urging the UK Government to provide additional funding to match the Scottish Government's commitment of £1,584 million in regards to city regions, the deals and investment. And I do absolutely welcome that as well. And it goes without saying that the leaving the EU, <coughs> excuse me, in a no-deal Brexit, will have absolutely catastrophic uh, results for Scotland and our economy. Now, the presiding officer, the FSB Scotland branch, has its office in my constituency, and I really do thank them for the work that they do. Indeed, Glasgow Kelvin has one of the highest percentage of SMEs, many of them using local produce uh, you know, in their products. Many of them export these products and import parts and ingredients for their products. And in the Small Business Saturday, I visited a number, as, as other uh, MSPs did, in my agency, in, in my constituency. And Brexit really did loom large in some of the questions they were asked. And uh, the concern about, as I said before, importing, exporting, exchange rate, tourism, uh, of course, the eventual viability of their businesses as a whole. And it's important that we do absolutely continue to support and grow our SMEs. They are the backbone and they're the lifeblood of our communities and a huge part of our economy and our future. And I think everyone would absolutely agree with that. The presiding officer, in the time that I have left, I wanted to comment on the report by the Fraser of Allender Institute, uh, Brexit and Glasgow City Region. Before I mention that, I think I perhaps will uh, absolutely say this to the Conservative Party. In the report, it says... Growth is projected to continue in the Scottish economy this year and next. But should a no-deal outcome become an eventuality, then growth is likely to slowly, sharply go down. Now, that's a lesson, so don't quote to me about various other issues when you can't quote the absolute truth as well. Now, this is about Glasgow and what's going to happen if Brexit, no deal, comes across. As a major European city, uh, with a diverse business rate, Glasgow in the city region cannot expect to be immune from the changes that Brexit will bring. Over the years, Glasgow City Region has punched above its weight and is attracting international investment. This is when public services rely very much on EU workers to help deliver care and support, and we depend upon that as well. The City of Glasgow was ranked sixth in the UK in terms of international investments, projects gained in 2017. There are over 700, 700 EU-owned enterprises in Glasgow City region, employing over 46,000 staff. So SMEs in Glasgow are really booming, much to what Rachel Hamilton said, they dropped. They're really booming, but the big worry is the fact that if Brexit comes about, what's going to happen to the EU people? What's going to happen to the easy EU workers and the EU nationals who actually own these businesses? That's a huge worry in certain areas, particularly in my area of Glasgow, and as I say, probably throughout Scotland as well. Now, Glasgow City Region, as I say once again, I don't mind talking about my own area and my own constituency, is crucial to Scotland's economy. That's what it says in this report. Glasgow City alone is estimated to have contributed over £20 billion 20 billion pounds worth of GVA in 2016, over 15 per cent of Scotland's economic output. What could we do if we had the full powers and levers of an independent country? 
much more than they can do when we're shackled to, I can just call a basket case of the UK as it stands just now, and it'll be even worse with Brexit. I would ask once again if Richard Leonard would support the amendment. I think it's rather sad that you come with a very, very good motion and to divide it like that. And I know I'm getting told now to be quiet, but thank you very much, President Officer. Neil Finlay, followed by James Dornan, and Mr Finlay, five minutes. Thanks, President Officer. Can I begin by echoing Angela Constance's call to end the banal comparison between Scottish statistics and UK statistics? I think that was a very sensible call, because that means absolutely nothing to the workers at Kayam, the workers at Michelin, HES, Carillion, Gemini Rail Services, Spark Energy, Debenhams, HMV, Alds, Bakers, Homebase, Fraser's, m and STV, Bifab and McDonald Hotels. Just a few of the companies who have announced closures or significant uh, job losses. Uh, and don't forget, since 2009, over 30,000 jobs have been lost in councils alone. You know, that's the equivalent of a Kayam a week for 100 weeks. That's the extent of that, just in councils, not the rest of the public sector. And all of that has caused uncertainty and fear and worry for those who remain in employment as pay is cut in real terms, hours are cut, or at times hours increased with no financial reward. Terms and conditions are attacked. This is not good for the economy or society, for people's well-being, and not good for social cohesion. In relation to Kayam, I was alerted to the situation by a friend of mine who works at the factory. And quickly thereafter, we received phone calls and emails from staff at the plant worried about their future. On Friday, Angela Constance and I, uh, on the Friday before Christmas, Angela Constance and I met with West Lothian Council and Scottish Enterprise to discuss the situation. And it was clear then that the company was on the verge of going under. Over that weekend, there was an outstanding response from the community to support the workers and also an outstanding response from West Lothian Council and indeed later the PACE team and other agencies. Uh, on the Monday, we attended a very busy meeting called by the administrators, where KPMG advised all uh, uh, workers that their jobs would be lost and that the wages they were owed on Christmas Eve would not be paid. Merry Christmas indeed. But, President Officer, as with much in the corporate world, all is not what it seemed. It soon emerged that the owner of Kayam had been involved in the purchase and sale of a business in the north of England in the previous year, securing what he described as a windfall in the process. Workers rightly are asking, where did the tens of millions go? We know that the company uh, filed its accounts late and were threatened with closure by Companies House. Scottish Enterprise at the committee yesterday painted a picture of an improving business and moved to profitability. profitability. But the staff who worked at the plant will tell you at times they were sitting around doing nothing and regularly asked the company how it was making money when they saw work drying up. We then established that Scottish Enterprise informed, uh, it was informed of Kayan's troubles on the 16th of November. Ministers were informed on the 22nd. Over a month before, workers were told there was no money to pay them. And at least one contractor who I met recently told us about receiving an order for goods and services on the 27th, putting that contractor out of pocket to a significant amount of money, meaning that they have had to make staff redundant. That, the owner of that business is absolutely furious that they've been put in that position when both Scottish Enterprise and the government could have helped avoid this. And of course, we were then left with workers having no money on Christmas Eve, leaving that meeting in tears. I find it difficult to comprehend that people simply just want to brush aside the fact that both Scottish Enterprise and Scottish ministers knew this company was in major difficulty, with serious danger of going under, and workers being left unpaid, yet no one thought to alert 300 families before Christmas. And last week we found out that Jamie Hepburn, the government minister, had not lifted the phone to the company. Now, Minister, I have to ask you, if you won't lift the phone to try and help save 300 jobs, what will it take for you to act? And in the same circumstances, would you do the same again? And will you now take the opportunity today to apologise to the workers at Kayam for your inaction? The responsibility for this company's demise, I am absolutely clear, lies with the chief executive. Lies with the chief executive. But there's something wrong with a system that hands over public money 
and allows this to happen. We have to have a serious look at how the conditions of grant awards to such companies are managed and enforced and the rights of workers to know what is going on in the place that they work and invest their time and effort in. Uh, if Kayam and all the other industrial, recent industrial bad news have taught us anything, is that we have to have an industrial strategy that rebalances our economy. We cannot carry on with the status quo. We need planning, we need more industrial democracy, and we need greater accountability. Thank you. Uh, can I remind members to speak through the chair? I understand why members may use the term you, but please, as has been said often again, please speak through the chair. I now call James Dornan, followed by Gordon Lindhurst, and time is absolutely tight, not just for you, Mr Dornan, for everybody. Mr Dornan, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. There's no doubt that this is a very important topic, and I am delighted to be able to participate. And I, too, would like to extend my best wishes to the employees of recent workplace closures particularly to those who were made aware of the redundancy during the Christmas period. There's never a good time to lose your job, but it's especially cruel to do so at that time of year. I'm under no illusions that there are challenges facing our economy. However, there should be a recognition that Scotland has recovered comparatively well over the years since the global recession. Indeed, our economy has continued to strengthen in the first half of 2018, with annual GDP growth the strongest since 2014 and above the UK as a whole. Scotland's labour market continues to perform strongly too, with unemployment falling over the past year and remaining close to its record levels. Scotland have, has advantages and resources few nations can match, and this SNP government is committed to building a more competitive, sustainable and fairer economy, and since 2007 have taken real action to support businesses, create jobs and build a more equal country. And thanks in part to the work of the Scottish Government in encouraging businesses to pay a living wage, our free access to higher education and our labour market strategies, the productivity in Scotland is growing much faster than in the UK as measured by output per hour worked. Scotland's best resources have always been its people and SNP policies will continue to support them and we're also assisting our businesses. Scotland's international exports valued at £29.8 billion in 2016 are up 44% under the SNP. Scotland is a top destination outside of London for foreign direct investment and we are helping small businesses expand and create jobs. Around 100,000 business premises now pay no rates at all thanks to the Small Business Bonus Scheme and to date small businesses have saved £1.3 billion through the scheme. We're also standing up for Scottish industry. It was mentioned earlier on about Scotland for EEO but further to that you also see the Scottish Government, which worked hard to secure a future for Scottish steel, the last remaining al aluminium smelter at Loch Haber and Ferguson Shipyard too. And as I've said, the Scottish Government has taken steps to help our workers, businesses and industries grow. But of course, we can always do more to improve the economy. However, as previously mentioned, Scotland does not yet have full control over all levers to grow the economy. The key powers remain at Westminster. Tax allowance for business, capital gains tax, corporation tax, employers' national insurance, tax and dividends and saving, to name but a few. We are trying to run this economy with one hand tied behind our back. The people of Scotland, as shown consistently in polls, trust MSPs here in Holyrood far more than they trust Westminster to look after their interests. The greater powers this parliament is given, the greater chance we have to support our people and our communities. And let's be honest here, the public's lack of confidence in Westminster will only be exacerbated by the carry-on which has taken place down there over the last few weeks. A carry-on which would have made Sid James and Hattie Jakes blush with embarrassment. Last night, the Prime Minister lost her Brexit vote. Yet despite this being obvious to everyone outside the Downing Street bunker, it's clear she does not have a clue what to do next. Signing officer, it could not be more clear that the main risk facing Scotland's economy continues to be the prospect of a hard Brexit. Any Brexit presents a huge threat to jobs, trade, living standards and investment in Scotland. But a Brexit outside the single market could cost Scotland 80,000 jobs over a decade and people an average of £2,000 in wages. All Scotland's hard work in protecting and improving our economy will be seriously undermined by this Tory Brexit we are subject to. A Tory Brexit, which it still amazes me to say, continues to be enabled by Labour. Now bear with me as I read through a quote which I've taken from the official report. In the wake of the Brexit vote, a survey by the Fraser Allender Institute of 320 firms across Scotland found that 60% believed that the outcome of the EU referendum will have a negative effect on their business. And that even more, 67% believed that the uncertainty that it creates is an additional problem. 
As we all know, the people who suffer most from any business downturn are those working people who are already on the most precarious contracts, who are already the lowest paid, who are in the deepest in work poverty and who are living from week to week. Those people will be the victims of any economic collapse as a result of breakfast, and they are the people the Parliament must speak up for. Now, these words, this quote, these very wise words, was made in 2016 by Richard Leonard, MSP, and he is right. Businesses are weary of Brexit, and the losers will be the workers. Yet only last week, he refused to confirm whether his party would campaign in a snap election to stay in or out eh, of the European Union. And even worse, last night, Rebecca Long-Bailey confirmed Labour would be campaigning to leave the EU in a forthcoming general election. Now, given his previous comments, surely it's incumbent on Richard Leonard to A, back a people's vote, and then B, ensure his Scottish Labour colleagues campaign for Remain. Labour Party members want me to do it. Scotland wants him to do it. Let's hope he takes the opportunity. Side officer, it's clear that the people of Scotland strongly believe that Scotland's future lies within the EU, as does this Parliament. Of course, we in the SNP believe Scotland's future would be best served by being there as an independent nation, something I truly believe will happen before too long. But in the meantime, I urge Richard Leonard and his colleagues to get behind any move to revisit the most damaging decision the UK has ever made voluntarily. That way, they really would be protecting Scotland's future for us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Dorn. I call Gordon Lindhurst, to be followed by Shona Robinson. Mr Lindhurst, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, other members have already spoken about this, but I think it is important that uh, we emphasise the situation. Just days before Christmas, we learned of the fate of computer technology firm Kayam in West Lothian. As workers across Scotland packed up for the holidays, Kayam employees were informed en masse that they would not be receiving Christmas wages and told they wouldn't have jobs to come back to afterwards. Now, whatever beliefs we hold across the chamber about how we run our economy, I'm sure we can all agree that the mistreatment of Kayam workers has been truly shocking in this whole sorry episode. Our immediate thoughts must be with the workers and how their long-term futures can be secured. It is encouraging to hear of the potential for the company to be purchased as a going concern with what appear to be over 20 notes of interest. But as well as these immediate tasks, there are clearly lessons to be learned for the future of our economy. In particular, lessons about how government resources can be used more effectively to deliver the sort of growth that is so badly needed for our economy. We've had to ask some difficult questions during recent economy committee meetings about just how those resources were used in the case of Kayam. Government financing was intended to bring about jobs and grow the economy of Livingston, West Lothian and wider Scotland. Yet more than 800,000 pounds later, the company were laying off workers and continued to fail to register a profit. Taxpayers' money, which could now be lost to a company whose track record in delivering for Scottish jobs and growth has been sketchy at best. In the best interests of the future of our economy and our workers, I hope that the due diligence over how these public funds are being used can be reflected upon and lessons learned for the future, especially given the sums involved and the jobs lost. Deputy Presiding Officer, our best interests are also served by maximizing the opportunities available to us to succeed in the modern economy. Opportunities that arise from initiatives such as the UK Industrial Strategy, which identifies and supports areas where Scotland plays to its strengths and which will be important for the future, including in financial services, life sciences, and higher education and research sectors in which some of the £1 billion arising from city deal investments will help deliver the high quality and diverse jobs that we want to see. In my own region of Lothian, we've seen £300 million of UK government investment as part of the Edinburgh and South East deal that is delivering exciting prospects, including major investments that could see the region become the data capital of Europe. The Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund further supports Scottish businesses and researchers, including a combined £9 million between Harriet Watt and Edinburgh universities, used for research on marine offshore infrastructure. 
So support is going to a wide variety of worthwhile projects and is directing funding to areas in which Scotland already does well. This enables our country to benefit from playing a key role in UK ambitions to be at the forefront of a modern economy in areas such as artificial intelligence and clean growth. But as we look forward and consider the future of our economy in a changing world, one thing that remains constant is the importance of our relationship with the rest of the UK. Not just when it comes to working together on the initiatives I have already outlined, but in terms of the importance of that market for our businesses, worth nearly four times as much as the EU to Scotland. Trading across that open border has become the norm for our businesses who export and 500,000 Scottish jobs remain reliant upon that border remaining open and barrier free. So, rather than sowing division within the UK and raising the prospect that this trade could be damaged, this SNP government should be working to maximize the opportunities that being a part of the UK market brings. And they should take the threat of independence, so-called, off the table that hangs over the head of businesses for whom the UK is their most important export market. By doing so, working constructively with the rest of the UK and delivering a pro-business environment, Scotland can improve its economic outlook, which sees growth forecasts being lower than the rest of the UK for the years ahead. I won't go through those figures again. We've heard about them a number of times already. So may I conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, by saying that we also need to simply look ahead optimistically towards a positive economic future that we can all work together to secure for Scotland. Thank you very much, Mr Lindhurst. I call Shona Robison to be followed by James Kelly. Ms Robison, <coughs> please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer, I want to begin my remarks by uh, where it should, and that is with a well-deserved tribute to the Michelin workforce in my constituency. The workforce are an extraordinary and tenacious group of men and women who, over the years, have overcome so many hurdles to keep the Dundee factory open in the face of adversity. The partnership that they have with the management team is a model of good working which has seen the workforce lead many of the reforms at the plant over the years and I've lost count of the times I've spoken about Michelin in terms of the positive industrial relations model that others could well take a leaf out and on that point the response of the Michelin management team stands in marked contrast to that of healthcare environmental services. I recently met with the eight Dundee based former employees of HES and they have been treated appallingly by the company bosses, no communication, no partnership working, workers left out of pocket with unpaid wages and other entitlements. And again, I call for the company to do the right thing and pay the, work, the former employees what they are due. But returning to uh, Michelin, it is not surprising given that the history of strong partnership working that when the devastating news emerged that Michelin will finally cease tyre production next year, that the local management team and the workforce approached that huge challenge with the same spirit, determined to work together to get the best outcome for the workforce and the best legacy for the factory and its site. And we all wish that it could have been a different outcome. We all wish it were uh, different. But uh, the response from the Scottish Government and the Economy Secretary, Derek Mackay, has been commendable. The Scottish Government was swift to offer every assistance and try to persuade Michelin of an alternative course. And when this proved not to be possible, the Scottish Government moved swiftly to establish an action group to examine all options for retaining tyre production and, if not possible, to repurpose the site to secure a long-term economic future. These efforts have been recognised by Michelin at the highest level and unusually for the company, they have agreed to engage with the Scottish Government to ensure that the site can be repurposed and a legacy created to ensure that there are job opportunities, not just for the existing workforce, but for those future generations who will need alternative job opportunities to Michelin. Michelin is working in partnership with the Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise, Dundee City Council and others to develop the next phase of the company's presence in Scotland and tra to transform the site into a key location for the new economic, uh, economic opportunities in manufacturing, remanufacturing, recycling and low carbon transport. 
It is welcome that Michelin have appointed a senior executive to co-chair the steering group and we await their proposals emerging in due course. And on Monday the 17th of December, Michelin signed an MOU with Scottish Enterprise and Dundee City Council to formalise this uh, commitment. Now, while the £10 million allocated for the Tayside Industrial Strategy uh, that was recently announced in the Tay City Steel is, of course, welcome, it has always been the case, as stated by Derek Mackay, that support for the Michelin Plan will need resources beyond that in the Tay City Steel, most of which, of course, had already been allocated to projects across Tayside. And I was pleased that the First Minister reiterated that commitment uh, rec as recently as last week at FMQs when I asked her to do so. I would also reiterate my call for the UK government to step up to the plate with the £50 million that would match the Scottish Government contribution also uh, to make sure that Dundee is supported through their manufacturing uh, strategy. I understand that there's been considerable potential commercial interest from many parties in developing economic opportunities at the Michelin site and I hope that many of these will come to fruition in due course um, through the work of the steering group. Our ambition should be that at least as many good well-paid jobs are created at the Michelin site before the final tyres are produced at the factory and I believe that this is achievable but it will require strong leadership determination and where necessary resources deployed strategically to deliver the plan once it's in place. I hope, well, if I've got time, well, I hope that you this have. may also retain a political consensus and support in backing the plan, which I hope Jenny Mara will confirm. Ms Mara. As Shona Robson knows, I've been working uh, very closely and happy to to back uh, solutions for the Mitchell implant. Given the job situation in Dundee, would she confirm her opposition to job losses and redundancies at Dundee City Council? Well, look, I Ms. know Robinson. money is tight, as Jenny Mara knows, and I know that uh, John Alexander and the SNP administration is working extremely hard uh, to avoid uh, uh, compulsory uh, redundancies. Um, but, you know, Jenny Mara um, uh, knows very, very well um, that uh, Labour are not capable of offering any alternative budget proposals, either in Dundee or in this place. And that fatally undermines her credibility on this issue because you have nothing to bring forward as an alternative plan. John Alexander has led from the front in Dundee, trying to seize every economic and job opportunity. And I hope that's something that Jenny Mara will back him on. Because the workforce, whether it's at Michelin or the council or anywhere else, deserves and indeed expects nothing less from us as local politicians. But in terms of how the Scottish Government can best assist in delivering the vision for Dundee, it is critical that strategic investment decisions support that vision, that, they are, that strategic investment decisions happen in renewables and commissioning in the deep water port that can enable it to grow and compete for future offshore wind contracts so it can be a main player in that field as opportunities uh, emerge. And I know that Dundee DCOM and the Council are working very, very hard. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, Dundee is a city transforming itself, building on its already strong performance in life sciences, gaming, and now as a cultural centre with the V&A. A strong manufacturing base is equally as important for the city. The port has huge importance in that vision. And of course, this alongside the redevelopment and repurposing of the Michelin site can ensure that Dundee not only retains a strong manufacturing base, but indeed expands and diversifies that base. Thank you. I now call James Kelly to be followed by John Mason. Mr Kelly. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think it's absolutely right that Labour devotes its business this afternoon to the, the number of closures that we've seen uh, throughout the country in recent months. And it's right to do that for two reasons. First of all, to show, as Patrick Harvey said, support and solidarity with those workers in local communities. But I think it's also crucial to, lesson, to, to learn the, the lessons from these, these closures in terms of how we can actually move forward and try and avoid some of these in the future. From that point of view, I want to draw on my own, own experience from the, the closure of the Two Sisters plant in Canvas Lang, uh, something that I found you know, deeply upsetting, not only because it's a, an area that I represent, but also because it's an area that I grew up in and I continue to, to stay uh, locally in Canvas Lang. 
Uh, there were some deeply unsatisfactory aspects of that closure uh, at Canvas Lang. First of all, when Jed Killen and I, the local MP, went to, to meet the management when the closure was first mooted, it was quite clear that they, they had already made up their mind, um, even though they'd still to go through a, a consultation process. Uh, it was really unsatisfactory because the plant had been there for 40 years, uh, processing chicken, um, still very much uh, a viable business. Uh, as things unfolded, it became clear that the company had been in uh, collusion with the main supplier, Marks and Spencers, who essentially were supportive, and they confirmed this to me in writing, that were supportive of moving the business from Canvas Lang to, Su to, to Suffolk. Um, added to that was the fact that when the, the 457 jobs were lost, which had a devastating impact uh, on an area like Canvas Lang, it then unfolded that two sisters had been given over a period of time uh, grants from Scottish Enterprise totaling 543,000 on the condition that they keep the plant operational on, on, until 2021. Uh, they turned the back, uh, their, their, their back on the community, on the workforce and on that plant. And it was revealed uh, it was in FOIs in November that they still had not paid back the £543,000 despite the fact that they had closed the plant down uh, fully in September. I raised this matter at First Minister's Questions uh, in November and when I met Scottish Enterprise just before Christmas, the money still hadn't been paid back. So uh, I, I, would, I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to ensure that that money is returned. And when it is returned, I think it should be reinvested in the Canvas Land community to help support the people and the families who lost their jobs, many who had worked over uh, a number of generations. I think this, this whole uh, aspect uh, focuses on the, the use of public money and... Uh, sure, yeah. Derek Mackay. Very closely to what all members are saying around enterprise support. Enterprise support is there to, to try and support the, of course, that economic, that sustainable economic growth and make the right interventions and there's got to be due diligence. But I just don't want to leave the point, and I may, miss a, I may have misheard uh, Richard Leonard in opening remarks in terms of whether the Labour Party is voting for the government amendment or not. But if the, if the Labour Party is not voting uh, for the uh, government amendment, I think it severely misses an opportunity to say to the UK government now that any Brexit is bad, and I know a deal Brexit is particularly catastrophic, because I'm listening very closely to members Mr. who are impassioned. Uh, Cabinet uh, Secretary, that, I hear that, but that's not, that's a long intervention, and I will give you your time back, uh, because that could have maybe dealt with in summing up. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr Kelly. Okay. You, you were sitting on the front bench earlier on, you heard Neil Finlay make very clear that the Labour Party are totally opposed to a no-deal Brexit. Going back to the serious point I was making about loans and the use of public money, um, as, as, Richard, as, as Richard Leonard pointed out, um, you know, the, the use of RSA grants have seen £220 million uh, going to foreign companies with only £140 million going to Scottish companies. So I think there needs to be a proper assessment as to the economic impact uh, of these grants. And in terms of loans, you know, it's a matter of real concern. The Sunday Mail reported in December that there are loans that have gone to firms that operate in tax havens uh, in Jersey and the Isle of Man. £18 million of loans to companies who are not paying tax. And really, I think we should be looking at calling such uh, loans in, you know, which are not uh, being used by ethical firms. I think uh, what we need drawn to a conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, is we need another approach, uh, which has got to look at putting people first. It's got to look at alternative business models like uh, co-ops. We need to address the, the upskilling in the areas where people have lo lost jobs and also look at the challenge of automation. I think these crucial le lessons have got to be learned uh, as we show support for these local communities, but how, how are we going to move the issues forward? 
Thank you very much. I'm sorry, the time is so tight. I call John Mason to be followed by Jamie Green. Mr Mason, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And I have to say in starting that I, there's a lot in the Labour motion which I certainly agree with. Uh, I do have one or two reservations and some questions, uh, and I'll try and touch on these in the course of my speech. And firstly, I do agree, as others have said, that we should be expressing solidarity with those who have suffered because of workplace closures. We are all part of a community and we all have a responsibility to help ensure that there are suitable jobs available for everyone and certainly to work with employers who are facing difficult times. I thought we had a useful session uh, yesterday at the Economy Committee asking Scottish Enterprise about their involvement with Kayam. Hopefully going forward, there will be a future for that plant. But looking backwards, there were quite a number of points that came up, including we do expect Scottish Enterprise to take some risks and I think we have to accept that some investments will not work out as well as we and they and everyone else would have hoped for. Again, we do not expect Scottish Enterprise to take a hands-on approach, but we, or, or uh, we do expect them sorry, to take a hands-on approach, but not to micromanage a business or to take the place of the actual management. And at the end of the day, as I think we've heard this afternoon, some companies' managements are much more proactive and transparent than others when they hit problems, and that is quite difficult to legislate for. I think that leads on to what types of jobs and what types of employers we should be looking for in the future. Maybe, as others have said, we have been too dependent on a few big foreign-owned employers in some of our cities and towns. And so if something does go wrong with them, that whole town is badly hit. I do broadly favour attracting inward investment, but clearly there are risks with that. And hence, the emphasis on the motion eh, on Indigenous is extremely good, and I agree with that. The Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee is currently working on the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill, and just on Monday evening, we had a formal meeting in Dumfries. A range of issues came up then, including, for example, is it better to have one big employer in a town like Annan with some 700 staff, or is that putting too many of our eggs in the one basket? Is it better to have 20 organisations with, say, 35 staff each? But again, on the other hand, does that take too long to grow that number of enterprises? Another question is the type of business and what it does. I think there's been broad agreement that Scotland should focus on the high end of the market, quality food, drink, technology, rather than trying to mass produce cheap widgets. We are never going to be able to undercut India or China on cost. However, that does also leave us with a challenge when, say, one of our more traditional factories, which has been going for a long time, but with a lower end product, hits problems and closes, as I have seen happening in my constituency. So I very much agree that we want an indig indigenous business development, as the motion says, and a more diverse economy. The Economy Committee has looked at some of these issues, and I think there were some encouraging signs about the level of business startups. However, we were concerned about what is called fear of heights and that there is a tendency for small indigenous businesses in Scotland to be sold off too soon. And often the owners are from out with Scotland and the potential has not been realized. Again, going back to the wording of the motion, putting the interests of employees and their communities at its heart for the economy is something that I hope most of us would agree with. Enterprises must be there to serve the wider community rather than the community being there to serve the enterprises. But I do think there's a balance to be struck in all this, and I have a slight concern that customers are not mentioned in the Labour motion. We have had problems in the past with the likes of British Rail and British Airways, when the good of the employees was perhaps overemphasised to the detriment of the organisation's customers, and the result was a very poor and loss-making public service. Now, I do believe strongly in public ownership, and I would have preferred if our gas and electricity and railways had still been in public hands. But we do have to get a right balance in all of this. A good enterprise will be good for the customers and the employees and the community. Again, I agree that we want more cooperatives and employee ownership models. Uh, last Friday, I was visiting one of the largest social enterprises in Scotland, uh, the Wise Group, which is based in my constituency, and I continue to be very impressed by all that they do. Turning to the Conservative Amendment, it is not, it is nothing if not predictable. I actually wrote this next bit of my speech before seeing the Conservative Amendment, and it turned out to be just as I expected. 
As usual, the Conservatives argue for low taxes to boost the economy as if cheap and cheerful is always best. Now, I certainly do agree with the stability in tax, and I would say this government has provided uh, that with relatively small adjustments year on year. However, I would challenge the Conservatives as to whether business is always attracted to the cheapest place. London seems to remain a very attractive place for the finance sector, despite high office rents, high salaries for staff, and high housing costs, presumably because there are other factors at play, like a large pool of suitable labor and a desire for similar businesses to co-locate. So in the same way, a place with low taxes and poor public services will not necessarily be attractive to business. Many businesses are looking for a good education system, a skilled workforce, and employees who will be wanting a good health service, good schools for their kids, even if that means paying a bit more tax. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I am pleased that Labour has initiated this debate today. As a party, they are somewhat a bit detached from reality. However, I think today I am, I am much I'm, happier. I'm sorry, you must conclude. I haven't even got spare seconds. You I must am sit much down. happier to be aligned you with must them sit than down. I am with the Conservatives. Don't speak Thank over you. the chair. Jamie Green, followed by Colin Smith, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer, for ending that speech. Uh, much to the benefit to the chamber. Um, can I say to uh, that? Don't, don't get me wrong. There were bits to Mr. Mason's speech I thought were very interesting around diversification of the economy, and I think I will probably touch on some of those issues as well. But his his, his mystic predictions of our amendment fascinate me. Um, there's nowhere nowhere in our amendment does it say anything we want Scotland to be a, a cheap place to come and do business. And I think the, the, the tone of that actually sends out completely the wrong message to any businesses watching uh, this debate and listening to the parliament. I'm sorry, but um, I'd like to thank Labour for bringing uh, a debate about the economy to the chamber. It's nice to see some of them actually arriving to the debate uh, as we approach the final minutes. Um, but I think there's an important point to make throughout this whole theme, and that's something that, that many have touched on from right across the chamber, and that's that uh, specifically around the issues that were mentioned in Labour's motion around uh, some of these business closures that we've seen. We talk about it a lot in this, this chamber, uh, some of these very large and medium-sized companies that are very important to, to small uh, towns and cities, and when they go out of business, the, the profound effect that it has on those communities is immense. Losing a job is never easy. Uh, redundancy is not just a financial issue for many, it's also a psychological one as well. So I'd like to think that whatever our differences, and there are many differences in taxation or state intervention or the privatization versus nationalization that, that Labour opened with, I think we should remember that what lies at the heart of this is jobs, it's people's livelihoods, and that growing the economy is not just about having a few extra pounds in your pocket, but it's about the important emotional and positive mental effects that being in work provides. Uh, Labour's motion uh, it has many things to welcome in it. It calls for a new industrial strategy to promote uh, indigenous businesses. We could argue that we are already doing quite well at some of that. Scotland is, uh, is famous for and getting better at being famous for its industries. The whiskey industry is the most commonly cited one. But what about our video games industry in Dundee or the satellite industry in the West? or dairy farming in the south. Uh, the UK government produced an industrial strategy uh, in 2016, uh, and I won't go into it in too much detail in the interest of time, but I think some of the things that it looked at are what the UK and Scotland needs to be doing to uh, future-proof its economy. Investment in R&D and attracting those types of businesses, improving productivity, which we all accept is an issue, promoting STEM subjects at an early age, and significantly upgrading infrastructure, uh, uh, which means uh, digital, housing uh, and transport networks to uh, attract people and businesses uh, to the area. The city deals, as others have mentioned, have provided more than a million pounds, uh, more than one billion pounds invested into uh, Scottish uh, cities and regions. Some of those, and some of that money will go towards uh, very uh, specific projects that I think we will see some tangible benefits from. Other projects I've mentioned before, like the Glasgow Airport, uh, I'm really tight on time, I'm sorry, uh, like the Glasgow Airport Air, uh, rail link, which I hope uh, uh, we can all get behind, I'd like to see some of these projects come to fruition, because I think they will deliver tangible uh, benefits. Uh, that in itself, though, is not enough. Uh, the Scottish economy is facing significant uh, challenges. Uh, we are growing at half the rate of the UK. That's not a political point. Wage growth is slow, and the forecasts do put us behind the rest of the UK. The reality is that our economy uh, for many quarters has been teetering on the edge of negative growth. Now I don't think that should be acceptable
to anyone in any party in this uh, chamber. Uh, to Labour's credit, they outline in their motion the need for business diversification and supporting indigenous growth. Now, I think those are two really important points to have in this debate. Um, it's important to recognise that uh, many areas in Scotland have suffered as the uh, traditional industries have declined. In my area, we're facing the issue of Texas Instruments, a tech business in Greenock. Uh, we've been struggling to find uh, a buyer for that business for quite some time, and a significant cross-party effort going into uh, uh, the, uh, looking at options for it. But what will uh, come down to is if we can't find a buyer, it will close. So what, what are the options for those people? It's the same story we have every time there's a significant uh, closure. Uh, these people either need to be reskilled and find other opportunities, or many will take early retirement. Uh, it can be done, though. I think we can future-proof uh, our economy. But to do that, and to truly have an indigenous economy, we need to support our young people. We need to give them the right skills of the future. We need to support our new industries like the gin industry, like the tech sector, like the games industry, like the satellite industry. Uh, transitioning workers uh, by improving their STEM skills, I think, can help them move from old traditional models into uh, the new world. We've got some ideas of our own. We don't have time to go into them today, but I would uh, like to touch on one specific, uh, and that's the Institute of E-Commerce. We think there should be a dedicated and specialist public agency dedicated to e-commerce to bridge that gap uh, between Scotland and some of our uh, competitive markets. Uh, we need specialist training, support and advice to businesses to get into the uh, digital uh, space. I think we're missing opportunities unless there is a, a renewed focus on the digital industries. When I was uh, initially uh, the spokesman for the digital economy, uh, I spent uh, many times calling for a dedicated digital minister in the government and it's good to see uh, that the, the fo renewed focus on the digital industries. Uh, I think this will help uh, uh, refocus our minds. But, you know, in context, uh, you know, this is Labour Party's debate today, and they think we can just have an academic argument about neo neoliberalism. I'm afraid uh, these benches make no apologies that what Scotland needs is, is an economy of growth, entrepreneurialism, and that wealth and job creation are not bad words, and nor should they be in this Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. I call Colin Smith to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr. Smith is the last speaker, penultimate speaker, sorry, in the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, however long I have the, the privilege of serving the people of South uh, Scotland as an MSP, I suspect I'll look back on the 3rd of April 2018 uh, as one of the darkest days. Parliament was in recess that morning. I was sitting in my constituency office and I received a phone call from someone I suppose you'd call an insider. They told me that later that day the workforce at Pennies of Arran will be summoned to a meeting with management from owners Young Seafood and told that the Pennies factory on Stapleton Road in Arran will be closing. To say I felt sick to my stomach would be an understatement. I've lived in Dumfrieshire all my life. I knew this was an economic tsunami for the area. Pennies was the largest private sector employer in Dumfries and Galloway. The closure meant the loss of 450 permanent jobs and hundreds more agency and seasonal posts. Let's put that into context. Annan has a population of just 8,500. 600 job losses for that community is the equivalent of 48,000 job losses in Glasgow, 41,000 in Edinburgh, 18,000 in Aberdeen, or 12,000 in Dundee. Pennies has been part of the economy of Annan since it was established over 40 years ago. Generations of family have worked there, in some cases, hold families at the same time. On the evening of the announcement, I spoke to one mum who told me she had worked at Pennies, so too did her husband, and so too does her daughter. A whole household facing the loss of their livelihoods in a single day. The response from the Scottish Government to the closure was a so-called task force. The community were told no stone would be left unturned to convince young seafood to change its mind. They were then promised everything would be done to find a buyer for the factory. They were then told support would be given to help those losing their jobs find alternative employment. In truth, since the closure announcement was made, just £250,000 has been invested by the Scottish Government directly to support the Pennies workforce. And that came from the existing budget of the South of Scotland Economic Partnership. President officer, we need an investment of £10 million and a proper economic action plan for Annan, not just 250000 It's now six months since the last worker left Pennies. The factory is closed and many of those workers feel forgotten. As the trade unions have highlighted, the UK government's decision in 2013 to half the 90-day consultation period to just 45 days before large-scale redundancies can take place gave no time 
to properly explore alternative options for pennies. But the tragedy of the pennies closure is not just the way so many livelihoods were cast aside so quickly at the whim of big business owners, Young Seafood. It's a fact that there are simply not the alternative employment opportunities in the local area for people to turn to. Less than 200 of the workers who held permanent posts at Pennies have found new employment, and just 38 of those jobs are within the town of Annan itself. Unemployment across Dumfries and Galloway is rising and is now at its highest level for four years. Presiding officer, the closure of Pennies exposes the neglect of the southwest economy. The gross value added per head in Dumfries and Galloway is just 80% of the Scottish average. It's the lowest paid region in Scotland with earnings 15%, 15% below the national average. The proportion of people of working age with no qualifications is 12%. That's twice the level of the Highlands and Islands. And we have a chronic problem of outward migration of young people due to the lack of high skill, high wage job opportunities in the area. The government talk about regional equity and inclusive growth in their past two economic strategies, but where has the inclusive growth been for the people of the South West, which has for far too long been a forgotten region. There's been a chronic lack of investment in our infrastructure, both physical and digital, with key trunk roads such as A75, A76 and A77 simply not fit for purpose. The lack of interest in the region by national agencies such as Scottish Enterprise under government direction has meant opportunities to properly support growth and indigenous businesses have been missed, robbing those pennies workers with the, of the opportunities they so desperately needed. President officer, in concluding, the tragedy of Pennies highlights the need for that new approach, one that sees investment in all of Scotland, expanding further in higher education opportunities in those areas that have been left behind, delivering for once the competitive advantage in the rural areas when it comes to digital, instead of them always having to play catch up, and ensuring we have a locally accountable South of Scotland enterprise agency that properly supports local businesses co-ops, social enterprises to grow and deliver the strong, diversified, sustainable economy we desperately need. Resolving to pursue that alternative way to build the economy of South West Scotland may be too late for pennies, but it would allow us to say never again. Thank you. I call Fulton McGregor, then, then we move to closing speeches. Mr McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Now, can I say uh, in all sincerity that I welcome Labour bringing this motion to the Chamber and I share their concern about the volume of companies going out of business and the impact that it's had on staff. Indeed, one of the first issues that came to my attention as MSP after being elected in 2016 was the, the closure of the tannoy business in my constituency. And as people would, will maybe know, they'd been a major employer in Coatbridge for decades, and the closure had a devastating impact on the workforce and their families when it happened. And more recently, the sudden closure of TOM, which although is in nearby Airdrie, impacted a great number of my constituency, constituents who work there. And I know my colleagues Alex Neal and Neil Gray, as well as the Minister for Business, Jamie Hepburn, have also been doing a lot of work on the recent closure of the also nearby HES site in Shots as well, and I'd like to pay tribute to them for that. And I also want to welcome some of the steps taken by this government to grow our economy. Of course, my constituency, for example, has benefited greatly from the Glasgow City Region deal through the huge investment and delivery of the Gap Cosh and Glenboy Glink Road through the Community Growth Area Project. And I'll, I'll take this opportunity to join um, calls from my colleagues for the UK government to be much more proactive and match the Scottish government's funding to city deals across the whole country. Presiding officer, as I have said, I welcome the opportunity to debate this issue and I would commend the chamber to back the government amendment. I think that both the motion and the amendment raise very important issues and I'm going to put a bit of focus here on the issue of Brexit. Despite the people of Scotland, Scotland voting overwhelmingly to reject Brexit, we are seeing our country and its businesses being affected in a way, in a most damaging way, by what has gone on since the vote. With less than three months to go before the UK crashes out of the EU, we have the most incompetent Prime Minister, probably in history, who has led our government to the biggest defeat in history yesterday over a deal which took her two and a half years to negotiate, which would have done nothing but damage to not only businesses in Scotland, but across the whole of the UK. And like many colleagues, I spend some of my time in the constituency visiting local businesses, large and small. And the fear and concern about Brexit, and particularly a no-deal Brexit, is very, very real. Today, my office, for example, spoke with the managing director of Chemco International, Colin Wade, who I should say I'm visiting on Friday. They are based in Shawhead and employ around 30 people locally. 
They are an international company which recently became employee-owned and they develop the most advanced coatings worldwide. Just this morning, he has sent a communication to the senior managers in his company to outline their preparations for a no-deal Brexit. In, he, in it, he describes the European Union as, quote, easily the largest single market. The communication also outlines that the issue will not only be with shipping finished products to the EU, but that, and I quote again, Chemco relies significantly on certain raw materials and specialist packaging that are manufactured, else components sourced from within mainland European Union. And it goes on to say that a no-deal Brexit will lead to delays in shipping queues to queues at ports throughout the UK. Furthermore, the general man uh, uh, I want to speak briefly about Clark Fire Protection, another international company operating in the world stage, which is based in Townhead in Coatbridge and employs almost 100 local people. And I've had the pleasure of visiting this company recently, and the general manager has told me that the complete lack of certainty about what will happen with Brexit has le left them unable to properly prepare, and given, like, just like everybody else, they have no idea what will be happening from one day to the next. She explained to me that over 80% of the products produced there are imported, and the business is under threat from their direct competition in mainland European Union. This is simply unacceptable that this UK government is causing my constituencies such uncertainty in relation to their livelihoods. President officer, I'm immensely proud to have these multinational companies in my constituency just getting on with the job day in, day out. And these are just some. I could mention many others, including, for example, Retronics, Freightliner and Gersheri, or the collagen casing producers Devro, based in Middlesbrough. President officer, it's clear that Coatbridge and Chryston is open for business through initiatives by North Lanarkshire Council and the Scottish Government. But the reality is that Brexit is causing significant concerns and there are very real dangers facing businesses up and down Scotland as a result of this shambolic UK Government's handling of the negotiation process. This is the real threat to businesses in Scotland. There can be no doubt that Brexit poses this threat. And as discussed here earlier, if a hugely damaging no deal can't be avoided, then it's going to become increasingly clearer to a majority here in Scotland that our best interests, needs and welfare will only be met as a fully independent nation. And I know that such self-determination will protect these businesses that I've mentioned and others in my constituency and protect the many workers and their families who depend on the jobs. And one last plea to finish off, presiding officer, a plea to the Labour Party. Please, when it comes to decision time, if you've not already made your decision how to vote, don't just vote against the SNP amendment for the sake of it, for the sake of voting against the SNP, not given what's happened yesterday with Brexit. It's time to unite and send a message against this con Conservative government. Please get back the government amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Closing speech, as I call the murder phrase, is close to the Conservatives. Mr Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. This has actually been uh, an interesting uh, debate. And can I start by thanking the Scottish Labour Party for taking the uh, subject Scotland's future economy. Uh, and despite uh, some of the rhetoric we heard from Richard Leonard at the start, and to be fair to Mr. Leonard, he does rhetoric very well. Despite some of that rhetoric about uh, ranting against uh, neoliberalism, there's a number of points of agreement uh, we would have uh, with the Labour Party. So in the spirit of consensus, I will deal with those first and then perhaps come to some points where we uh, don't agree. And what we heard during this debate was contributions from, from right across uh, the chamber, from individuals talking about the impact on their communities of large uh, plant closures. So uh, Jenny Mara and Shona Robson talked about uh, Michelin in Dundee. We had Angela Constance, Neil Finlay and Gordon Linters talking about Kayam in West Lothian. Rachel Hamilton talked about Monetti in Jedburgh. James Kelly, uh, two sisters in Canvas Lang and Colin Smith, Pinney's in uh, Annan. And there might have been others um, who uh, I've missed. And I think it's absolutely right to highlight the uh, concern about individuals who uh, have lost their jobs or whose jobs are at risk following these recent workplace closures. These are always a difficult time for individuals and any government must be active in providing support to those who lose their jobs. It's a sad reality that in a dynamic economy there will be businesses that fail from time to time. And it is not the business of government to be involved in trying to save all failing businesses regardless of the circumstances. Otherwise, we would still be subsidising candle makers and wheelwrights. But the role of government should be to support those who lose their jobs 
And if it is appropriate through government intervention to secure a future for a business by going down a new route, then that should be explored. But above all, what government needs to be doing is creating a supportive business environment, allowing successful companies to be created and to expand, and providing jobs for those who might be the victims of redundancy elsewhere. And that is precisely what the Scottish Conservatives believe the economy here should be all about. Uh, yes, of course. Cabinet Secretary. Does Murdo Fraser believe that Brexit is that very uh, helpful environment in which businesses can prosper? Murdo Fraser. I believe Brexit is creating headwinds, but it's not the biggest threat to the Scottish economy at the moment. And I believe for the number of speeches we've heard on the SNP benches today, for people pressing the case for independence at this time, there could be no greater threat to Scottish economic recovery than the prospect of another independence referendum. But I want, to, I want to pick up something else that was raised in the debate, firstly by Richard Leonard and then by others, including uh, John Mason. There was this suggestion uh, that uh, too much support has been given to foreign-owned companies. Interesting, in the context of Richard Leonard's speech, that a, a gentle irony that he railed against nationalism in all its forms. And they went on to make that comment about foreign-owned companies. And this issue about whether government agencies are more supportive of inward investors rather than indigenous, indigenous companies is something that I recall being addressed in this Parliament's economy committees I've served on in previous sessions. And it is a, a perennial uh, issue. And yet, despite that, evidence in support of that contention is actually quite hard to find. Scotland does have a very good record in attracting inward investment. We've had that record for at least the last three decades. And we should not see that as a negative because many people have had successful careers in these companies with well-paid and secure jobs. But I do think it's fair to recognise that the structure of our economy means we are not growing enough of our homegrown talent. And we have an hourglass-shaped economy with a smallish number of very large companies where if they close there's a major jobs impact, a very large number of very small companies but not enough in the middle. And if there has been a failure of enterprise policy over a period of decades, it has been a failure to grow those middle-sized companies that are the mainstay of the economy in many other countries, uh, such as Germany. Where we would depart, uh, presiding officer from Labour, is in relation to some of these solutions. We believe that Scotland needs a competitive tax regime, not one where business is treated as a cash cow. Corporation tax may, be may not be devolved, but business rates are, and it does remain a concern, as Rachel Hamilton pointed out, that the large business supplement is still set at a rate much higher than the rest of the United Kingdom, putting our businesses in uh, this sector at a competitive disadvantage, particularly a point for those close to the border, as Rachel Hamilton's constituency is. And I fear the Labour Party would go even further than uh, the SNP in terms of business taxation. Now, Labour's motion reference... Um, I, I need to make some progress. I've only got a minute left. Because I want to talk about the industrial strategy which Dean Lockhart... Gordon Lindhurst and Jamie Green uh, mentioned. And this is a substantial investment from the UK government, promoting innovative ideas, great people, major infrastructure upgrades, the best business environment, and prosperous communities across the UK. And we see evidence of this in the city deal projects being promoted across the country. In the area I represent, the UK government's contribution to the Tay Cities region deal has been supporting innovation, with £20 million to the International Barley Hub, and 25 million to the Advanced Plant Growth Centre in the James Hutton Institute in Invergowrie, 5.7 million to the development of the Cyber Security Centre of Excellence at Abertay University, which I visited last week, 10 million for the uh, Perth City Transformation Project, including the refurbishment of the Perth City Hall, and up to 5.2 million for advanced plastic reprocessing in the area, amongst other projects. A practical example of how the UK industrial strategy is working to improve the economic uh, environment in our country. And there but, you must conclude. I'm very closed. sorry, Mr. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I now call on Jamie Hebburn to close for the Government Minister. Seven minutes exactly. Thank you very much, please. President Officer. Can I also join with others at the outset, welcome uh, today's uh, debate uh, as well. Although it may not have appeared so at many junctures in this debate, there is much agreement, I believe, uh, across this chamber uh, in terms of the sentiment of the Labour motion. In that regard, I can say here and now we will support that motion at decision time. But I want to begin with uh, the Tory uh, amendment, in particular the opening remarks from Dean uh, Lockhart. And ordinarily, presiding officer, in these uh, debates, you reflect on what people 
have said. I want to reflect on what Dean Lockhart didn't say today. He failed to say that over the last year in Scotland, economic out growth has outstripped the UK as a whole. He couldn't explain why the latest figures show that Scotland has outstripped uh, business research and development expenditure growth uh, that compared to the UK, 13.9% against 2.9%. And he didn't mention that since 2007, we've seen 93.6% increase in business research and development expenditure compared to 27.2% in the UK. He didn't mention that between 2007 and 2016, productivity growth is here in Scotland higher than any other country in the UK and all regions of England, three times the rate of the United Kingdom. He didn't mention that the, you can mention what you want to mention in a minute, Mr Lockhart, let me continue to tell you what you tell Mr Lockhart, well, he didn't mention, President Officer, at this juncture, he didn't mention that we have a joint record low level of unemployment. We didn't mention that we have achieved our headline target of reducing youth unemployment by 40% by 2021 from 2014 levels four years early. He didn't mention that youth employment is 3% higher in Scotland than the UK. He didn't mention that the Scottish Fiscal Commission has revised their growth forecast for the Scottish economy in 2018 by double the previous estimate. He didn't mention this belies Rachel Hamilton's suggestion of an unsupportive and the number of registered businesses have grown by 16.6% in Scotland since 2007. And he didn't mention the value of exports in Scotland is up 45% between 2016. But let's see what he's got to mention now. Dean Lockhart. Th thank you. I didn't mention it because the vast majority of data shows that the Scottish economy is underperforming the rest of the UK. You mentioned productivity, productivity in Scotland still below the UK. And talking about your own economic targets, the SNP has failed to meet every single one of your own seven economic targets. Yeah. Jamie Hepburn. President officer, I've literally gone through system by system, systematically demonstrating the success of the Scottish economy, often by comparison to the rest of the UK. And we hear from Mr Lockhart about an underperforming economy. That, I thought it was important to place that in the context, but I do think we should recognise, uh, of course, that we do face challenges locally and nationally. In that regard, I, I want to turn to Labour's position in respect of our uh, amendment. It is very clear. Uh, President officer, that uh, here and now, the most fundamental immediate danger to our economy is uh, Brexit. And what we've heard uh, from uh, the FSB uh, just today, Colin Borland has said, we're not going to find our way out of this mess, that's the UK government, Tory government mess, without cross-party collaboration and cooperation. We heard very clearly on a number of occasions that the Labour Party says they are against a no-deal Brexit. They have the chance today to put their money where their mouth is. They have the chance today to demonstrate that is the case. And today, of all days, when we debate the economy, when we know that Brexit is the most fundamental risk to the Scottish economy before us, when we know that if we have a no-deal Brexit, it will lead to further closures and job losses. This is Labour's chance to demonstrate that they clearly are against a no-deal Brexit and back this amendment. It is beyond me, yeah. beyond my understanding, President Officer, why they will refuse to back this amendment. Perhaps Mr Finlay will explain why. Neil Finlay. For the, for the third time today, we oppose a no-deal Brexit. What part of that don't you get? Now, I've gave that commitment. Will you give a commitment to apologise to the Kayam workers for failing to lift the phone and make any effort to save 300 jobs? Jimmy Hepburn. I'll, I'll come to Kayam in a minute, but here's my challenge to Mr Finlay. He says he's said three times that they oppose a no-deal Brexit. Well, I'm asking them just one time, one, okay, one chance today to press their button to support our amendment, yeah. to demonstrate that they are against a no-deal yeah. uh, Brexit. In terms of some of the other uh, issues that were covered, and I won't be able to cover uh, all of them uh, today, uh, President Officer, but there was uh, some suggestion about bias in regional selective assist assistance by uh, the leader of the Scottish Labour Party. I think that is an unfair characterisation, frankly. Uh, it is clearly uh, any, uh, the basis of any consideration of regional selective assistance that uh, a proposition that is placed before our enterprise agencies will be given its full the consideration. I think in the first context, we should say that of the 75 offers made to companies in 2017-18, eh, 99% were made to small and medium-sized companies, something I'm sure every member in this chamber would welcome. 
But the idea that regional selective assistance isn't supporting Scottish-owned enterprise is not correct, President Officer. From 2009 to uh, 2010 to 2017, 2018, there were 869 RSA accepted offers. Of those, 578, 578, 66. 0.5% were to Scottish companies, 109, 12.5% were to UK non-Scottish companies and only 21% were to companies owned out with the UK. Now clearly we want to do more and we must do more and we will consider more. Now I have a minute left I believe, President Officer, so I do want to turn to some of the issues that have been uh, touched upon. Michelin it was uh, touched upon. Clearly uh, we uh, regret very much the decision that was taken by Michelin uh, to uh, withdraw from their current activity. But what we can see there is a positive example of a company willing to remain engaged uh, in uh, the city, working with the government, working with uh, unions to secure a positive future. That's something that we are taking forward uh, through our uh, Michelin uh, Action Group and through the memorandum of understanding we have signed with them. That will secure a positive uh, future for uh, the Dundee site there. But what else will, he uh, uh, what else will help is if we can see the UK government and Jenny Marr asked what support we can give the City of Dundee. We're providing £200 million uh, for a city region deal for Dundee. The UK government is shortchanging that city region deal by £50 million. So here's another challenge to the Labour Party and to Ms Mara. Again, you have the opportunity yeah. to demonstrate yeah. that you support the Dundee city region and every city region uh, area in Scotland by calling on the UK government to meet the commitment of the Scottish Government to meet the same amount of investment. You can do that again today. You can rule out a no-deal Brexit. You can back the Scottish city regions by saying that the UK Government can invest the same amount. And to do that, you can back our amendment. And I call on Rhoda Grant to wind up the debate. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We brought forward um, the debate today in the shadow of company closures and huge job losses. And these are frightening statistics. However, they all represent people's lives and their futures. And to be told that you're losing your job and possibly others in your household are the same <clears throat> is truly terrifying. Your future is in the balance. Many people are one pay packet away from a food bank. And we saw this graphically at Christmas when workers were not paid and forced to resort to food banks. We need real change to rebalance our economy. We need to move from chasing inward investment from abroad to supporting and promoting our own indigenous businesses. While we need to do this, we need to put employees and the communities they support at the heart of our economy. Workers need to be able to own and run their own companies, and we've seen the success of many worker-owned businesses and co-ops, yet these models of ownership are left at the sidelines when it comes to support. And this is simply wrong. These companies endure providing jobs and economic development. The wealth they create is kept in their communities rather than moved overseas. I'm a Scottish co-op party MSP and I'm proud of it. In the short term, we would like to see the doubling of the size of the cooperative economy in Scotland. And this would lead to greater wealth in our communities and more socially aware employment. Richard Leonard and Neil Finlay listed many of the companies under threat of closure. And this is a damning indictment of the management of the economy by the SNP. Many they knew about and did nothing about. Others they put down to mis can be put down to their mismanagement of the Scottish economy. We need real change in economic policy. The opportunity for those workers to buy those failing companies following the, the, the principles of a right to buy under land reform. Cabinet Secretary. Thank for taking the intervention and simply ask if Labour believe that Brexit is a threat to the economy, it will lead to more closures. Why isn't the Labour Party voting against that Brexit this evening? Rhoda Grant. I will, I will come to that later in my speech, but I want to point out to the government what their policies are wrecking the Scottish economy. The cuts they impose on local government uh, councils have made huge job cuts in our communities. They've done nothing about that. And those jobs are those well-paid jobs 
that are needed within our communities, supporting the most vulnerable. Jenny Mara talked about the impact of job losses in the wider community in Dundee, talking about Michelin, HMRC, and local government as well. All the way back to Timex, the first trade union conference addressed by, that I attended was addressed by Timex workers, women fighting for their jobs. They inspired me to get involved in the trade union movement and politics. Neil Finlay reminded us of the distress of the Kayam workers going unpaid just before Christmas. How angry they must have been knowing that the government had pumped money in and when they knew they were going down under, didn't even warn them. Where did their loyalties lie then? Was it to the Scottish workforce or was it to the overseas owners? I have to Neil Finlay. Neil Finlay. There's my frustration that in a debate on recent job losses in the Scottish economy, the minister who was involved in it didn't even mention it in his speech. Rhoda Grant. I, I absolutely agree with that and I think it's disgusting that the minister... Did. Maybe the minister is going to address that very comment. Lee Hebber. Let me uh, observe that, of course, I'll always reflect on what more I can do personally in any of these circumstances. But Ms Grant and the Labour Party must surely understand that in these circumstances, every effort is made by this government, by our agencies, to do what we can. That was the case in CAIM. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work out the way you would like it to. But that was the effort there, and it will continue to be as we go forward. Rhoda Grant. That fell short of the apology we were looking for. <laughs> James Kelly talked about two sisters. They received £543,000 of public money. Had that money been given to the workforce, maybe those jobs would be still there today. Colin Smith talked movingly about the impact of the closure of, of Finney's uh, devastating whole communities and the point he made about small communities where large job losses can have a disproportionate effect and I understand that with job losses in Dingwall, Invergordon and Fort William in the Highlands and the impact that has on their communities. Presiding officer, um, can I just turn to the SNP amendment? The amendment talks about the threat of Brexit and it is a threat. It has already damaged our economy. But we, and we will never, and I state it again, never support a no-deal Brexit. However, what is lost in the nationalists is that independence is an even bigger threat. We do four times more trade with the rest of the United Kingdom than we do with Europe. If the last few months have told us anything, it is to avoid independence at all costs. They don't see it. Their Cuts Commission pointed it out and they still don't see it. The biggest threat to the Scottish economy is independence. Presiding officer. Okay, that's quite enough. Let's conclude our speech, please. That's quite enough. Order, please. Rhoda Grant. Presiding officer, we need to retain the benefits of industry within our communities and we need to work with them. That is the way we build our economy and lift people out of poverty. We need an economy that works for the many, not the few. An economy where wealth and power are shared and that empowers our people. That should be at the heart of the Scottish industrial strategy. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on Scotland's future economy. The next item is consideration of a legislative consent motion. Could I ask Jean Freeman to move motion 15391 on the Healthcare International Arrangements Bill? Formally moved. Oh. Yeah. Thank you very much. That question will be put at decision time. But before then, the next item is consideration of business motion 15428 in the name of Graham Day. On behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme, could I ask Graham Day to move motion 15428? Moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. No one wishes to speak against this motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 15428 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed.
The next item is consideration of three business motions, 15416 and 15418 on the stage one timetable for two bills and 15417 on the stage two timetable for a bill. Um, I'm, could I call on Graham Day to move all three motions? I move, presiding officer. And if no one objects, I'd like to move uh, all three motions on block. That's good. The question, therefore, is that motions 15416, 15417 and 15418 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of parliamentary bureau motion 15415 on approval of an SSI. Could I ask Graeme Day on behalf of the bureau to move this motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you. And we come now to decision time. The first question this evening is that amendment 15390.3 in the name of Derek Mackay which seeks to amend motion 15390 in the name of Richard Leonard on Scotland's future economy be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 15390.3 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes 70, no 47. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 15390.1 in the name of Dean Lockhart, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Richard Leonard, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division again and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 15390.1 in the name of Dean Lockhart is yes 28, no 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 15390 in the name of Richard Leonard as amended on Scotland's future economy be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 15390 in the name of Richard Leonard as amended is yes 70, no 47. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 15391 in the name of Jean Freeman on the Healthcare International Arrangements will be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 15415 in the name of Graham D on the approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move now to members' business in the name of Gail Ross on Highland Youth Survey, but we'll just take a few moments for members and the Minister to change seats. <laughs> 